Hello everyone and welcome to our Advent and Christmas story time. This week, if we had been meeting in our churches, we would have been celebrating what is sometimes called White Gift Sunday, uh, a Sunday when we gather up food and uh, clothing and gifts for people in need in our communities. And we're not able to do that this year because we're not gathering, and so you may have noticed in our newsletter uh, and in the bulletin that we are asking you to make a donation directly to those organizations, the Lakefield um, Food Bank and the Women's Shelter in Peterborough. And so uh, if you've not already done that, please do take some time to do that. And in celebration of, um, of that tradition, the white gift tradition, I have a story here called uh, Just Like New, and it is written by Ainsley Manson and Karen Rekzuk, and it was uh, loaned to me by Brendan Neal. There aren't very many stories about White Gift Sunday, and so uh, thank you for loaning me this one, Brenda, and I, I hope you enjoy it. Just Like New. Sally was snapped out of her daydream by the sudden silence. The shuffling, snorting, and giggling had stopped, and the whole Sunday school class was listening, really listening, to their teacher, Miss Buxton. And because of the war, she said, lots of children in England aren't going to have any Christmas presents at all this year. Sally stared in disbelief. In Canada, butter and eggs were hard to find because of the war, but shortages in England must be much worse if there were no presents. Next Sunday is White Gift Sunday, Miss Buxton went on. I would like each of you to bring a gift wrapped in white for one of those children. Sally decided she would use crisp white paper and a fluffy flouncy bow. Her white gift would be extra specially magnificent. Your gift is not to be bought, Miss Buxton continued, but it must be just like new and it should be something of your own and it would be more meaningful if it was something that you really loved. Sally and her brother walked home with Peggy Tompkins. Peggy was staying across the street with the Browns, but her real home was in England. She had come to Canada because of the bombs. It wasn't safe in her city. Peggy and Jim were chatting, but Sally wasn't listening. She swished through the falling leaves, thinking about White Gift Sunday. Just like new, she thought. At least that meant she wouldn't have to give one of her books. Because of the war, books were scarce, and she loved the few that she had. She was glad they were all worn and shabby. no presents in England for the children, Sally asked Peggy. I expect the toy stores got bombed, said Peggy. Now that's not why, said Jim. It's because they're using all the tin and wire and wood and paint that they usually use for toys to make wartime things instead. Planes and tanks and guns and bullets. That's horrible, said Sally. After Peggy turned in at the Browns house, Sally and Jim walked on alone. What are you going to give? Jim asked. Sally shrugged. She hadn't decided. I'm going to give the book about flowers that Aunt Ethel gave me for Christmas last year, Jim announced proudly. But Miss Buxton said you're supposed to like the gift that you send, said Sally. In fact, you're supposed to love it. Jim laughed and marched ahead. He liked to march like their dad had marched before he'd been wounded in the war. Left, right, left, right. But suddenly he didn't about turn and march back and he blocked Sally's way and frowned down at her. You, he said in his meanest big brother voice, you are the only one who knows I hate that book about flowers, right? Right, said Sally. And you're the only one who will ever know, right? Right, said Sally again. At dinner that night, Sally and Jim told their parents about White Gift Sunday. 
and Jim told them that he was going to give Aunt Ethel's book about flowers. Sally squirmed when they praised him for his thoughtfulness, and Jim gave her a kick under the table as a reminder. And what are you going to give, Sally? Mom asked. I'm going to give one of my dolls, said Sally without hesitation. Mom looked quite surprised, but not as surprised as Sally felt. She had no idea that she was about to say such a thing. Are you sure, dear? Mom asked with a look of concern. Of course I'm sure, Sally said with a carefree toss of her head. I'm too old for dolls anyway. But as she said it, she wondered how she could possibly give away Thelma or Susie or Anne Marie. Dad got up from his chair and gave her a pat on the head. A kind and thoughtful idea, he said. And you do have three dolls, so you will still have two when you send one away, won't you? Sally wasn't very good at arithmetic, but she had already figured that out. She nodded, gave him a weak smile, and then excused herself from the table. I have to give one of them away, she whispered as she walked up the stairs. Who will it be? Who will it be? Thelma or Susie? Or Anne Marie? Thelma and Susie and Anne Marie just stared at her when she told them that one of them was about to go on a long journey. Thelma was the oldest. Sally had had her for as long as she could remember. When Sally was very little, she had cut Thelma's hair because she thought it would make her look pretty. It didn't. And now one eye stayed closed all the time and two of her china fingers had chipped off. Miss Buxton would not approve of Thelma. Thelma was not just like new. Susie was a rubber doll. She had a tiny hole in her pursed pink lips. And when Susie gave her a drink, when Sally gave her a drink, Susie was supposed to wet through a tiny hole in her other end, but sometimes the wet went through her left arm instead. The dog next door had made two rows of tooth holes in Susie's left arm when he had mistaken her for a bone. Just like the Red Cross nurse who had bandaged up her father's leg, Sally had made a bandage to cover up the tooth holes, but still, Susie wasn't in very good condition. Miss Buxton would not approve of her either. That left Anne-Marie. She was just like new. She had been a gift from Sally's godmother. Her eyes opened and closed and they were edged with long lashes. She had thick golden braids that Thelma envied and she had smooth arms that Susie envied. She had come wearing a red plaid taffeta skirt, a dark green velvet jacket with tiny shiny buttons, and a straw hat with flowers on its brim. During the war, Sally's dresses were passed on to her by cousins and friends, when, and when she grew, they had extra bits added on at the hemlines. Her mother explained that they had to share and make do. Sally had explained to Anne-Marie about sharing and making do. So now, Susie wore Anne-Marie's dark green velvet jacket with the tiny shiny buttons and it covered her tooth marked arm. Thelma wore Anne-Marie's straw hat with the flowers on its brim. It covered her ugly bald head and it made her almost pretty again. Just like new, Miss Buxton had said. So who would it be? Anne Marie, of course. Sally apologized to Thelma as she eased the elastic from under her chin and took back the straw hat. Then she apologized to Susie as she undid the tiny, shiny buttons and removed the velvet jacket. In all her finery, Anne Marie looked perfect again. Sally tried not to think about her decision for the rest of the week. And the following afternoon, Mum found a shoebox that Anne-Marie would fit into. She also found white paper and a silky ri ribbon. Sally wondered about the ribbon, but when it was ironed, she had to agree that no one would ever guess it had once been a part of Aunt Ethel's petticoat. Sally gently placed Anne-Marie in the box and put on the lid. 
I think she will go to Princess Elizabeth, don't you? She asked her mum. No, I don't think that, said her mum, deftly folding the paper into sharp corners at either end of the box. Who then? Sally asked. <coughs> I expect she'll go to a little girl just like you. A little girl who, because of the war, has a piece added to the hemline of her dress, just like you. A little girl, because of the war, who has darns in the elbows of her sweater, just like you. But a little girl, just like you, who doesn't have a doll because her country is being bombed. Sally felt a lump in her throat as she placed her index finger on the ribbon for her mother. Sally put the beautifully wrapped white gift on Anne Marie's empty chair. The room seemed extra quiet. Thelma stared at Sally with her one good eye. Susie stared at the white gift that was Anne Marie. Sally lay on her bed and hid her face from them and she began to wonder about the girl just like her that her mother had told her about. And then she realized with horror that she wouldn't even know Anne Marie's name. Sally found a piece of paper and a pencil her name is Anne Marie, she wrote. She belonged to me, Sally Nicholas, 4000 Melrose Avenue, Notre Dame de Grace, Montreal, Quebec, Canada, the world, the universe. I liked her. Now she belongs to you. I hope you like her too. And then she carefully undid the ribbon, unfolded the paper and opened up the box. Anne-Marie was asleep. Hoping she'd stay like that all the way to England, Sally slipped the note under her jacket. Folding the paper in the same place as she wrapped up the package again. It took ages and it was just as she was readjusting the bow that was somehow not as beautiful as it had been when Jim appeared at the door. I was just thinking, he said. I could give you my old bear and you could send him instead. Sally shook her head. He nodded. I know, he said. Old bear isn't just like new. Jim sat down beside her on the bed. How's she going to breathe? He asked. Sally looked at him in alarm. I know, let's stick straws in her nose, he suggested. And before Sally could answer, Jim was off to the kitchen and back in a flash with two straws. They carefully untied the ribbon again, unfolded the paper and opened up the box. And Anne-Marie slept on as Jim stuck one long straw in each of her nostrils. Then with a penknife, he had made two holes in the cover of the box so the straws could stick out. The hardest part was making the holes in the wrapping paper as well, and then disguising them by tying the bow over them. The paper was now rumpled and smudged and the bow lay limp, except where the straws made it poke up. It was snowing the next morning and even though it was still October, the church looked like Christmas. They had brought the wooden baby Jesus out early so that everyone would remember that the white gifts were going to England as Christmas presents. Sally liked walking down the aisle and placing her white gift beside the wooden baby Jesus, but she didn't like leaving it there. Her brother Jim hated walking down the aisle and placing his white gift beside the wooden baby Jesus, but he was delighted to leave it there. Sally thought about Anne-Marie Anne all that week. On Monday, her father explained that she probably wasn't even at the Montreal Harbor yet. On Tuesday, her mother said Anne-Marie would be on the boat, but she wouldn't have sailed off down the St. Lawrence yet. On Wednesday, her parents agreed that the ship would have pulled anchor and sailed away. Sally wondered if the straws were staying in Anne-Marie's nostrils. She wondered if the box was lying down or standing on its end. If it was lying down, Anne-Marie's eyes would stay closed and she would stay asleep. If it was standing up, her eyes would be open and she'd have to stare at the inside of that dark cardboard box day after day, all the way to England.
Is she there yet? Sally asked on Sunday. She's somewhere on the high seas, Jim answered. He made high wind sounds and he howled mournfully. He arced his right arm up and down, up and down, outlining the high form of the waves. Sally felt seasick just watching him. Were the straws in Anne Marie's nostrils now? Were her eyes opening and shutting every time she went up over one of those big waves? Sally wished they'd stuff the box with something to keep her eyes closed. She tried not to ask questions for the next few weeks. Just before Christmas though, Jim said, wouldn't it be awful if Anne Marie's ship got torpedoed? Learn to think before you speak, Mrs. Nicholas said crossly, looking sideways at Sally. When Sally began to cry, her father said in a voice of authority, that ship arrived in England a good two weeks ago. You have nothing to worry about. On Christmas Day, Sally thought about the little girl far, far away on the other side of the world, opening the box and taking the straws out of Anne Marie's nostrils. She would sit her up and Anne Marie would open her eyes and look around at her new country. Sally hoped bombs weren't falling on her town, like on Peggotty Tompkins town. Christmas was over and the new year began. She longed for news of Anne Marie. Finally, on the first day of spring, the postman handed Sandy, Sally an envelope with an English stamp on it. She opened it and carefully drew out a thin blue sheet of paper. Dear Sally, she read, I thank you for your gift and I thank you for your note. I love Anne Marie. I especially love her green velvet jacket with the shiny tiny buttons and her straw hat with the flowers on its brim. Anne Marie is my only doll. I will look after her carefully forever and ever. Love from Deborah. P.S. Let's be pen pals. Yes, let's be pen pals, Sally wrote back, and give my love to Anne Marie. The end just like me. It was hard for Sally to give up something that she loved so dearly. Something that was just like new. Something she probably would have wanted to keep for herself. But she knew that that doll was going to be loved by someone who really needed it. And so this season at Christmas time, find a way to share a little joy. Find a way to live the spirit of the white gift tradition here at Lakefield and Young's Point United Churches. Even though we can't gather to share them all and send them on their way, you can still make someone's day a little brighter, share a little bit of joy, a little bit of Christmas spirit. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.